Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Nate. And I'm Drew. Yes, we are collectively the Linux Cast. We are a podcast that talks about Linux, and we're going to talk about that tonight because that's what we always do. Uh, the dirt joke never t- falls well the second time you say it, Matt. I'm just saying that. Anyway, anyways, it has been an extraordinary long day, so my sense of humor is shit. Unlike usual, is where it's awesome. Uh, anyways, <laughs> we're we're gonna go around the horn as we always do and talk about what we've done this week in Linux before we jump into the main topic. So, Drew, what you been up to this week, bud? I am going to sound like an absolute broken record uh, because I've been doing NextCloud and Jitsi for the week. Uh, But I will say this, okay? So I haven't really done that much, but the documentation, so modifying documentation has been what I have been doing. And it's not sexy. It's not that interesting. But frankly, sometimes you do what you have to do in order to complete a, a task. And that's what I've been doing. I've been modifying and improving my own documentation. And if somebody chooses to use that, hopefully it will help them as well. I use uh, justaguylinux.com for my documentation. And if you are interested, have a look there um, and you may find something you need. So that is all. Drew, are you still as enamored with MK Docs as you were when you first started? Uh, I'm going to say no, actually. Um, I like it. Do I love it? No. But I've been thinking about looking into other things and including, you know, because we've talked about this before, you and I, Matt, about using your own Git server. And that might be something I would consider doing. Um, I'm also thinking about just like a wiki, you know, doing a wiki. And that might be something I want to take a gander at as well cool because i've been look. i've been thinking about i mean i'm okay with what i have right now which is just everything in a git repository yeah i mean it works fine but every time i go to your website oh that looks really nice so i thought like, maybe mk docs is the answer but then i look at it like ah eh, you're putting a lot of work for that and, I, and i'm a lazy sob so i don't know if i want to do all that work so yeah i think it's the setup but and then you'll you'll be good you know that's 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 bottom line once you set it up then you're good yeah that's something I've been thinking about. I don't know yeah. about what I'll do. All right. What about you, Nate? What you been up to? So I've just been testing Cosmic. That's about it. Because all I've really been doing is work and more work and work. So uh, basically, I'm trying to get ready for um, next week because I'll be off. So thankfully, have a little bit of a break. But I have been testing Cosmic. And I can't really tell you what on because that's my nugget of the week. So uh, okay. All those secrets. All right, uh, <laughs> so, so I have been working on my Bluefin review. I'm almost ready to record that, and I've been talking with George Castro about all of that stuff, and he's been trying to simplify the marketing around it for me a little bit. And I've been preparing myself finally for a brand new desk. I've been talking about a new desk for two years, and I... <laughs> I, I'm, I've talked about this before, but the reason why I've been very reluctant about it, because the desk I have right now does need to be replaced, but it weighs a thousand pounds. It's solid oak, and I have no clue what to do with it. Good news is, I finally figured, so I, my nephew is going to come and get it and take it off my hands. So it's going to be gone, and I found the desk that I'm going to order. It's on sale, so all i got to do is hit the button. And then I went to Amazon and like, oh, I'm, I'm going to have myself a really nice desk set up. I might as well get myself some good stuff. So I spent way too much money on like I, I have a monitor arm coming and some speaker stands and some speakers because I don't right now. I, I've never said this, but I don't have any speakers at all. All I have is headphones. I have no room for speakers. The speakers that I did have the just burn out for whatever reason. They're like 30 years old. So I haven't replaced them, so I'm going to have those. And then I got a, like a laptop stand because I'm getting an L-shaped desk, so I'll have room for my laptop on the desk, which is going to be you know, cool. It's going to be an awesome setup. I still got to press the button to buy the desk. <laughs> I'm still very – I've been, I've looked at so many desks over the course of the last two years, but just really in the last like two weeks, that they're kind of all blurring together. And I'm, I'm still not sure – I mean – because the range in prices is weird. So, like, there's some out there that you can get, like, desk for, like, two or $300. And then there's, like, a desk that's, like, $1,300. And you look at them, like, those look like the same desks. So, I mean, do you, I mean, do I spend a lot more 
and you know hope that it lasts longer or do I spend less and worry that it's going to break in half in a year or it's going to wobble like crazy I don't know that's where the reason why I'm still you know, I, it's going to happen in the next before Thanksgiving because if it, the sale on the one that I'm really leaning towards goes off the day after so yeah that's what I'll do and w once I finally get that set up I'll f be able to do like a, a workspace video or whatever that people have been asking me for for four years right now I wouldn't do it because it's a fucking mess <laughs> like I can't share this because it's horrible uh, even if I clean it like there's my cable situation do you guys remember that scene in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where Chevy Chase's character hands the the lights to his his son it's just like just a gigantic ball of tangled uh, lights that's my situation with cords on my desk it's horrendous the other day just as an example of this I switched back to NVIDIA for about 30 minutes and then went back to AMD. And somewhere during the time of switching back and forth between my cards, I somehow managed to hook, in, hook up the wrong HDMI cable. For whatever reason, I had two HDMI cables plugged into my main monitor and I plugged in the wrong one. And the way I knew it was wrong because it really goes into my KVM switch so that I can switch back and forth between the two computers I have on this desk. And I went to edit one of my videos. I hit the KVM switch to switch between the PCs and nothing. I was like, what the hell is going on? So I had to go spelunking into this gigantic ball of cables trying to figure out where the problem was. And it took me two hours to figure it. Because I, I, at one point I had a KVM switch that had a, enough ports on it took up all three of my monitors which means I had nine display port and HDMI cables just hanging around on my desk the problem is is that my lazy ass <laughs> didn't move those so they're all still the 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 like non hooked up cords that are just laying there in the ball of cords so it's it's <laughs> it's horrendous I have a problem <laughs> I think it's so bad. Uh, so, yeah, that's the reason why I've never taken a picture of my entire desk setup. At least you don't have, you know, like seven machines. But it looks... So I don't want to hear about cables. It looks phenomenally <laughs> good in your, in your space there. Right? Yeah, Nate, you've done a much better job. <laughs> if that was me, half of mine wouldn't work because they wouldn't be plugged into the right place. <laughs> that would be horrendous. Yeah, anyway, so that's uh, that's basically what I've been doing is I've been messing around trying to get ready for that, uh, trying to at least somewhat get it so I can move this desk and get it away from here. So, anyways, so let's go ahead and move on to the main topic, which is a topic that I thought we'd actually done before. It sounded very familiar, but it turns out all we did was use the title. And we talked about how, I believe it was just Tyler and I, how documentation is really hard on Linux because developers aren't good at it. But this time we're going to go a little bit more general and actually talk about some of the actual pain points of using Linux or switching to Linux. So what I thought we'd do is just go right around and say, first say, if you had to name the absolute hardest thing about switching to Linux, what would it be? Drew, why don't you go first? Um, for me personally, or just in general, is this a general well, question? You can go for it both ways, which actually, yeah. let's, go, let's go personally first for, for you. What was the hardest thing when you first switched? To yeah, Linux? we talked about this a little bit in the past in the sense that I, I needed a, uh, a scanner and a network scanner, a network uh, printer to work. And it just didn't work that right, that well out of the box. I think that other people may have some different issues, you know, and, you know, we've talked about people that are tinkerers and then there's the normies I guess this is the way to describe just your normal desktop user and I think that they have like kind of a lot of a myriad of things that they find challenging uh, when making that switch could be package management but I think overall maybe hardware compatibility may be something that others find a little bit more challenging especially if you are an NVIDIA user, for example. I am not, but I can imagine that that is something that people can't just automatically like fix out of the box. So that Wi-Fi adapters could probably be in those two, in, you know, in that category of like finding uh, solutions to those problems. It's really silly that in this day and age, like, like Linux is over 30 years old. 
graphics cards have been a thing forever. It's been the same two companies forever. And having your displays work is like the responsibility. Like if you could say the operating system has one job, putting a picture on the display is that job. Like it's the only job that really matters. And to be in a day and age where half of the people who use a certain card still have issues solving that one problem is astonishing. And it's all NVIDIA's fault. But, and, and it has gotten better, but it still feels like, it's one of those problems like, how is that? I like, sure, you know, gaming or whatever, always been a problem. But how can the one thing that you have to do right still be an issue. Nate, what about you? What were some of the things that you had a hard time doing and what do you think the hardest, the absolute hardest thing to do on Linux is? If we're talking like when I first started out, probably just understanding the file system because it was completely different than Windows. And, you know, things are in different places and the way it's structured. And now that I've gotten used to the Linux file system, I hate Windows file system. I don't know why there's a forward and a back backslash like windows just pick one option please <laughs> irregardless <laughs> and then of course you know there's always been the drivers issue but i think file system and also actually having the hardware to support what i need was my was my biggest pains that's gone away by the way so that's a credit up for linux uh i won't be the old man to not like matt and crap about it it's my job it's it's yeah. in a job description. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so all right. So I'm gonna actually take it a little bit more uh, before you even get to the. In I think the installation is still the hardest part of Linux, and I'm not talking about actual installation, because once you get to the installer, it's fine. But all three of us have used different computers. All three of us own different computers. Every single one of those computers that you own gets to the boot menu in a different way. Every single one of them do, and. Figuring out how to do that, kind of hard. And if you have like things like Secure Boot enabled, yeah, if you if fair. you if you forget, if you try to, if you don't know the specific secret handshake you need to do in order to get to the boot menu when you're using UEFI, any of those things, number of things can be extraordinarily hard for someone who has no clue how to bypass that or get through it. And what do you Google? Like, if I told my mom who, who's 80 years old, that she had to get into the boot menu of her PC in order to install her operating system. She'd look at me like I was a dumbass, like what, like I was from another world, and she'd have no clue to do it. And even if you take the, you know, if I, if I asked my, you know, 30 year old niece or whatever to do it, she wouldn't have a clue how to do it. Um, I mean, and and she she I mean she would know. I mean she has a phone and she's somewhat tech literate, but she'd still have no clue because I mean. She probably does know what brand laptop she has, but does she know the model? Because a lot of times you could have two HP laptops and both of them would get to the boot menu in a different way. You know, one of them would use F12, one of them would use F11, one of them would use delete key, one of them would use the escape key. And not all of them will say in the, like on the, the, the splash screen there at the startup, what you're supposed to use. Some of them do, some of them don't. Like the, the new laptop that I do, that I have doesn't tell you. You have to just kind of guess. So you you basically have to <laughs> smash the entire function row in the escape key in order to figure out which one. And then how are you supposed to know which one worked if you smashed them all at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> you know. So I I, I think I, I think that I, and and I've talked about this before is that if you I mean you have to be somewhat tech literate to download an ISO, figure out how to get that thing onto a USB key. So you are already ahead of 90% of the people because the vast majority of people don't know how to do that. But if you've done that, you should at least be able to figure out how to get into the boot menu, but that still being an issue it is a huge deal, I think, for Linux adoption. And that's one of the reasons why in order for like Linux to go mainstream, you have to consider that the best way to, for that to happen is for Linux to be pre-installed on computers because then you don't have to deal with that, that problem, right? But it's just never happened. So I think that if you had to ask me what the absolute hardest thing to do when it comes to Linux, it's still that initial part of the install process. Because we've done a good job of making regular installers like Calamari's and the Ubuntu installer and I, the new Fedora installer is pretty good. You know, mo most mainstream distros do a good job of having the actual installer work well. 
But getting to that point is still phenomenally hard for people who aren't as tech literate as the average nerd. I think that that's where I'm from. Yeah, I think the other thing is, um, and I haven't used a Windows computer in a long time, but don't a lot of them already have like a uh, a dedicated recovery tool that um, that's already built in it's like some type of like part of partition of in your hard drive that's that is like oh you're having problems here go to back to your <laughs> go back to this partition and do uh, you know do the do the recovery and that needs to be removed as well so that that could be another challenging feature of you know changing your operating system completely well i've i've thought about this for a while like the bet the best thing that linux could do if we can't get the hardware deals to get dedicated hardware that people can go into best buy and buy or get on amazon and buy the best thing to do and i don't know if it's technologically possible or not not a developer but would be to have a tool that you could boot into linux into windows it will write it to wherever it needs to write it to and then when you, you just press a button it will restart your computer and boot into the iso that's the way it works windows can do it but Windows owns Secure Boot, like so. So I, I don't think, from a Linux point of view, it's actually possible. But that's the way that it should be done. It just isn't, or maybe it's not even possible, right? Yeah. So I think the other thing too. I mean, I wanted to add just uh, software availability, like because we have we have mentioned, you know, the and and Nate has mentioned the fact that Adobe maybe end up, you know, as web apps at some point, which might be you know, which will defeat that objection uh, in the future. But as of right now, we, there isn't that. And so if you are an Adobe user or any of those suite of products, or if you are a Outlook user or any of that, then then moving over to a Linux, Linux-based machine is is challenging because you're not going to be using the tools that you've been using for the last decade or two or three even. And that is something that you cannot do without if that is something that, you know, especially if you are in graphics, for example. Mm -hmm. Or music production or yeah, uh, AutoCAD, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Nate, you were going to say something? Oh, I was going to say, I, I know there was there has been attempts for installing Linux distros on hardware since the recent ones, the HP dev model that came out with pop OS, that was a actual manufacturer that was supporting Linux, but they canceled it because there just wasn't enough interest. And I think part of it too, is that they didn't really stick it out in, you know, like Walmart or Best Buy or places like that. So people could actually see it and actually use it and see that there's another option. But I don't know. I, it, because you bring up the point that you said about like having to go into BIOS and disable secure boot and turn off the TPM chip and all that extra stuff. Like most people are not going to know how to do that. So in, in a good way for my business, it's a good thing because that keeps me in business. But, you know, for other people that are tech support, that's not getting paid. <laughs> It's kind of a bad thing. Yeah. Well, the thing you're talking about with hardware, yeah, there have been, I'm like, uh, Lenovo has PCs with Linux on mm -hmm. it and Dell does. Dell, at least, they bury those things and you can't find them. Like, they, they, they exist, but you have to, you have to really want one to go find it on their website. It, it's like they're, like they're, um, like they're the, 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 they're the redheaded stepchild. They <laughs> hide that thing as far underneath the stairs as possible so that nobody knows it's there. And, Part of that, I think, is because of support. They don't want people to accidentally buy a Linux laptop, get it home, and realize that, oh, my God, this thing has Ubuntu on it. I have no clue what I'm doing. My point there is that people need to learn how to freaking read, but I understand their things. They don't want to have to have deal with returns on something because someone accidentally bought the wrong operating system. But I, I think that in a lot of ways, the, the hardware vendors, the mainstream hardware vendors who have tried to do the Linux thing have a big problem with it because they don't want to have to deal with the support that has to come along with it. So they have them, but there's kind of like a secret understanding that if you buy this thing, you're kind of on your own if you want actual support. You know, I don't know what the support is like if you buy an Ubuntu laptop from Dell. You know, like, can you imagine calling their tech support and asking them how to do something? I mean, it'd be... I mean, I know what it's like to calling and getting support for Windows. I can't imagine what it would be to get support on an Ubuntu laptop from Dell. It'd be 
an amazing experience. I kind of want to try it, to be honest with you, because <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be something to write about. Because it just it just feels like it'd be absolutely horrific. So I, I think that the hardware thing. I mean, there are so many things when it comes to the process, right? That could be made easier if Linux existed on mainstream computers. But there are also hangups on that because I mean the, the support infrastructure just has to be there and it's just not that's the reason why system 76 exists very well as a very small company and if you go to system 76 you know you're getting a Linux computer you're not going to be bamboozled thinking that you're getting a Windows computer with and accidentally get something different because that's all they sell right so let's see the it kind of meandered off in, in already into the how would we fix those things but do you guys think just from a base level, not an installation or anything like that, that Windows is easier to use than Linux? I mean, I don't. Say it again. Go ahead, Matt. I so, missed it. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you think that Windows is inherently easier to use, not in terms of installation, but actual usage than Linux? For me, no. Not now. But if you would have asked me five years ago, yeah, probably. Just because of familiarity. I mean, you also got to remember there's there was how many millions of PCs that had Windows, so everybody used it. So, do you guys find yourself like like going to a, like providing support to someone who's using Windows and going, "Oh my God, this is unusable." <laughs> Did you all the time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah really but bad. once again, that's my job. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of normal. It, it's easier for me. What I do is I actually carry two laptops. So I have one that's Windows, that one back there. And then I have another one that is Linux. And so if I need to actually do some production or some IT stuff, I'll hop onto my Win or to my Linux machine, use it, use what I need, and then go back to whatever they're doing. And that's really how I function. Even cloning drives, surprisingly. Yeah. The thing is, like when I when I have to help a family member who still uses window Windows. The thing that always gets me is that it's not that it's different and it's not that I don't remember how to use Windows, but the it, it, there's just certain pain points to Windows, but it feels hard to judge that because I'm so used to the way Linux does things and I, I'm certainly absolutely 100%, 1 million percent biased against Windows, right? Ever for me, there's no good thing about Windows, and we know that that's not true. Like there are, if you had to be objective about, there are good things about Windows. I can't name them. <laughs> Software support, driver support, hardware support. You're much more objective than I am. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, uh, but, but it's true though. Yeah, it, it is, and it is true. But that, that's the thing is like I I can't because I I can't remove myself from that bias like because I look at. Like, I understand that Linux isn't perfect, and we've talked about the things, how some of them tonight that you know are wrong with Linux. But for me, Linux is the baseline. That's what I judge everything else against. And when I compare Windows to Linux, it just doesn't measure up, and that makes that it makes the support hard because it's always tinged by. I mean, I've told my mother this multiple times. Like, you know, if you just used Linux, this wouldn't be so damn hard. <laughs> You know, I, I've said that so many times. She, she won't do it because she she's familiar with with Windows and she doesn't want it to change, and that's fine. But every time I offer support, that thought enters my mind multiple times. So it's a lot harder to judge for me. Like, is Windows actually easier to use? If that's all you've ever used, probably. You know, switching to anything new. Like, if you had to, it's like switching between a uh, an uh, a, automatic and a manual transmission you know i mean technically same process hell of a learn learning curve trying to get that clutch to work the first time you know you're, you're gu guaranteed you're stalling at least once probably many many times and probably in the worst possible situation when you need to actually be moving there's people behind you waiting at the red light you know that's going to happen and i mean obviously different situations here but switching to linux is kind of like that Technically, still an operating system, still use a browser, still use an email client, but there are so many little points that are different, not necessarily worse, but different, that it causes it not to be as easy to use for people who have only ever used Mac or Windows. So, Do you think the documentation is an issue, though? I mean, are, do we have documentation 
that helps new users or newcomers to create like their own, you know, to do their own tasks or to like manage themselves? Because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week in the sense that terminals, you know, I think that a lot of our step-by-step -step tutorials are centered around commands. And if I am a new user and I don't understand the difference between apt and DNF and things like that, then am I going to be like, what the heck, man, this is unusable. I can't get this to work correctly because, and even if I'm in the terminal, I, I don't understand what the right command is for my particular distribution. And, and is the software centers good enough, like the GNOME software or the Ubuntu software center, are they good enough so that I can install things? Because as a, well, I mean, I'm just gonna go and play the devil's advocate here. If I have an EXE or an MSI and I'm in Windows, I can install something like that. And is that, the, is that, is that a drawback for new Unix, uh, Linux users that they can't do that? I mean, that's yeah. just my point, I mean, you know. Yeah. And on, well, I will say this, I, I think we're too, when we talk about documentation, a lot of us think of it in the old sense of actually taking notes and producing it onto a website, which is still needed. But I'm going to be the first one to tell you, uh, as many people have brought me their PC, the first thing they did was YouTube. Mm. And if they can't find it on YouTube, that was their documentation. And if they couldn't find it, then they got confused and gave up. Then it would find somebody else. The and horror yes. of someone coming across one of my <laughs> early videos looking for how to do something, just <laughs> that's a nightmare. Like, don't don't use the Linux cast for documentation, people. It's not a good idea. He doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but okay, with that being said, technically that's not true because there's some videos that I have watched of yours that I figured out an issue. And it had a lot to do with I had an older kernel, and it still works with that particular kernel. I don't know if it does on a new one, but it still worked. So there is that. I think that surfaces one of the issues. Like, Drew, you mentioned documentation. Like, there's a lot of documentation out there. But first off, the vast majority of it's for Ubuntu. So if, you don't, if you're not on Ubuntu, you're in trouble. But second of all, a lot of it's 20 years old. And if you – Google's not the best – at search at, at sifting the newest most relevant thing to the top a lot of the times it's the things that have been clicked on like the if if your link has solved problems for people in the past and has gotten a lot of traffic because of that that's probably going to be the first result but it may be that that thing worked 10 years ago whereas it may not work now and as we talked about, I think this was in the lug where, where the people will click on this thing and the first thing they'll tell you to do is open a terminal and copy a command yeah and not only does that add to the stereotype that you can't use Linux without using the terminal, but it, it also scares a lot of people away because people don't want to use the terminal. It's a scary thing. Um, and, and if you, you guys want to actually s listen to us talk more in depth about the whole terminal thing, we did that on the lug. The link will that, for that will be on the channel. You can go check that out. But the, the whole point is just like documentation is definitely a problem. And like Nay says, the first place a lot of people will look at is, is YouTube, but they'll also Google it. And that, and it's just not that Google is bad for surfacing stuff. It's just that the internet is huge and it doesn't purge old, unuseful stuff anymore. It just stays there in perpetuity. And chances are you're going to stumble across that one time. I'm sure we've all Googled something, found something on Stack Overflow that's like from 2006 and yeah. thought, you know, tried it and it doesn't just doesn't work anymore because linux and linux despite the fact that people think that it's old-fashioned has actually changed in the last 10 years to you know 20 years and it just you know some of that stuff just doesn't work and that's a huge issue there's not just one place that, like in an ideal world or whatever we'd have a wiki that would just so be like the, the new user's guide to, to, to Linux and people could go there, know that it exists and, and all your stuff there it be com contributed to by the, by the community. It'd be well pruned so that there's a whole bunch of editors always going in and making sure things are not as, you know, stale or whatever. There'd be warnings on things that were maybe a little bit iffy, you know, it'd be well uh, maintained and all this stuff, but it would be astonishingly hard to create because 
everyone uses a different distro. Everyone uses a different desktop environment. Everyone has a different entry point in terms of where they're coming in on those things, but also with their level of knowledge when they first come in. Some people know what they're doing. Some people have no effing clue. And I'm going to say this with all the respect I have for every developer that I know. You guys are all shit at writing documentation. You're, I've never met any developer out there that's really, really good at it. And it's not that you can't write documentation that's good. Like, here's a good example. The Qtile documentation is fantastic. But if you don't know Python, you don't know shit. If you read that thing. It's, it's just, it's for, it's technical. It's, it's for people who can read technical documentation and do something with it. If you're a brand new per, brand new user, you don't know any Python, you've never read technical technical doc, documentation before, you're going to be lost. You're going to have no clue. Another example, I mean, just to pick on the window manager, Xmonad. Like if you, if you ever go to their documentation, they don't even have their own documentation. It's just the Haskell documentation is for Xmonad. And if you don't know anything about Haskell, you're lost. Like in the weeds. It's just the way that it is. And that's the same with a lot of other things. Maybe not as complicated as those examples, but developers in general just can't write documentation for, because they're so far removed from being a new user. Like, like it's really hard to put yourself in the position of someone who doesn't know anything. <laughs> you know, the thing that would be fun. I mean, I think these developers are going, then you have no business using Qtile. <laughs> you have no business using Qtile if you don't understand this, you know? I don't know. It's I, I, when I look at the software center, for example, though, and uh, by the way, I wanted to say something in terms of packages themselves are not named exactly the same on every single distro, which is really frustrating sometimes, especially for a new user. I was like, I need this genie plugin that is the snippets plugin. Well, okay. Genie hyphen plugin hyphen snippets. Nope. Not on Debian. It's called Genie hyphen plugin hyphen XML snippets. You know, so it's just, oh, okay, well, there you go. That's what I was missing. I, no wonder I couldn't install that stupid plugin because it wasn't named the same on every single distro. So anyway, I understand when it comes to some of the frustrations that people will have, but I did read in the, what was it? It was in Reddit this week, as a matter of fact, that... It was a Reddit post in the Debian uh, Reddit area where it was a, entitled Why Getting Debian 12 in Late 2024 is an Insanely Good Option Over Windows 11. And it was a Windows user, guys, that switched from 11 to Debian 12 and he had a fantastic experience. And I was just like, thank goodness that there are some people that are like, putting out their like success stories as opposed to that that YouTube explosion that happened a few months ago on that basically a bunch of Windows users decide I'm going to try I'm going to try Linux for the next 30 days and they failed miserably you know overall I I, I don't know that everybody did but it seemed like more than any but more than more than 50% of them basically ended up switching or you know not really switching long term they ended up switching back part of that and i made a video about this is part of it. content creators aren't normal people we have things that we need that don't always do well on a switch between operating systems so if you're really used to using premiere to edit your videos your your switch to linux is going to suck because Premiere's not on Linux. It's never going to be on Linux. And the alternatives, I mean, Nate and I will just be able to tell you this flat out. The alternatives to Premiere on Linux aren't anywhere near what Premiere is. Like, not in terms of like quality, but just like functionality. They're like, even the two that would qualify as actual competing products, Resolve and Premiere, right? They're completely different workflows. Switching between one and the other would be would would be a nightmare for the vast majority of video editors. It's just it just would. And take that further and try to switch to something like Caden Live, it's just gonna be hard. It's damn near impossible. You have to you have to when a content creator switches to Linux, you have to really want to be able to switch to it in order for you to do it because you're going to have to put up with so many pain points. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're going to problem. But I don't think the vast majority of people are in that position. They, they have other pain points, things like AutoCAD and maybe Photoshop, right? And 
the, like you talked about earlier, Drew, those pain points can be really hard to overcome. And part of it is just that, yes, there are alternatives to a lot of the things on Linux that you would need elsewhere. But first off, a lot of the alternatives aren't as good. It's just sad to say GIMP is not as good as Photoshop. It could be if they'd actually, you know, hire some people, like go on, have a fundraiser, hire some people and move your asses. I, like That's just my opinion, but ha, version 2.0 has been out since like 2006. We're just now getting to 3.0. It moves too slow in order to actually compete with Photoshop. It's just the truth, right? And, and that situation just happens over and over again because a lot of times these tools are created by three or four people, if that. And that's an issue. Right? It's just they're just not going to move as fast. They're not going to have as many features. They're not going to have as much support. You know, you know, it's just the sad truth of it. And I, I think that the content creators have to. They don't want it as much as some people would want it. Like you have to actually have a good reason other than just you want to make a video about it. I, th I think that that's you know the case. But that kind of leads into the next question. You, you said something earlier, Drew, about um, if, if people can't understand the Qtile documentation, then they shouldn't use Qtile. So it leads into the next question. Should the Linux community even care about Linux being so hard? Like, like is, is, do we even, it, are the pain points that we've talked about even really something that we should try to fix? Like, do you think? Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Dick. I can if you want. Yeah. I am going to answer that in two ways. If you're just a normal, regular community-based user... No, because more than likely you're already a tech head and more than likely you've already made the switch and you're just kind of hopping around from distro to distro and basically Linux is your gaming technically. And that happens to a lot of us. If you're coming from a company standpoint, yes, a hundred percent in particular valve right off the top of my head being one, even with Microsoft, some, some of the things that they use are Linux based. Uh, Google, absolutely, because they they basically steal the Linux kernel and make it their own, sort of. So, yeah, that documentation, especially for companies, I would say 100%. And how you feel about it, I'm not sure. And I was also going to pull up something else. Somebody made a comment that uh, we're talking about Linux being hard for distro hoppers, not new users. But you can't look at a, Lin a Windows person and say that they're stupid. Because the fact of the matter is, a lot of the people that are in the Windows space, I have my my IT guy that's over me, all he uses is Windows. And he could do magical things in Windows. But he doesn't use Linux for whatever reasons. And so these are still things that are all going to come up and pop up in people, especially if you're going to install Debian. Lord help them. I'm sorry, <laughs> G Drew, but <laughs> it's not as simple as it seems. What? Watch a video, bro. <laughs> yeah, like, that's the problem. You gotta honestly, watch a video. <laughs> Butter FS. Whereas Windows, you literally put it in and you say, "Oh, I want to install this," and it's like, "Okay, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're getting there." <laughs> well, then Drew, the first thing Drew does in a Debian install, like, "We're yeah, we're not gonna just use the regular installer. We're gonna go into this, and it's gonna be expert install, right?" <laughs> yeah, uh, that automatically removes some of the uh, scares some of the people. Yeah, I, I try to say, "Listen, it's expert install, but it's not that expert, really, if you're really talking about it." But I I hear what Nate is saying in terms of like the Linux community. And there's, I mean, we, we, we all know that, that there can be some toxicity when it comes to asking questions and stuff like that. The truth of the matter is, I think we've actually made progress over the last decade in terms of making it easier for a transition. You know, I think the transition points have been easier because even 10 years ago, my gosh, it, you, you would... You would actually have to be a really technical person in order to get your desktop or laptop to to run Windows. Uh, sorry, to run Linux in any way, shape, or form. I don't think I don't think we're there anymore. But at the same time, if let's just say I was able to install it for a Windows user, that really their needs are based on what you can do in the browser. And generally, that's a lot. That takes up such a large percentage of users. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that percentage is. I'm just thinking that, you know, especially and 
to Nate's point, you know, a lot of people are just using their phones, especially younger adults are just using their phones or, or tablets. What are they actually doing? 90% of what they're doing is, uh, you know, web-based, you know, it's just, that's just the fact, you know? So if I was able to install, let, I don't even care if it's Debian, dude, seriously, if, if it was Linux Mint or what have you, or Ubuntu, or I don't even care, you know, I wouldn't do an Arch distro for a new user. That, that's just, that's just a recipe for disaster. But, but even if you're just doing that and there was a browser easily accessible to that user, I think they'd be able to do it. I don't think there would be that much of a, an objection, honestly. Yeah, I, I think you have a point to do that the vast majority of people are there and that Linux has done a good job of, at least in, as time gone on, catering to those people more. Like, you can use whatever browser now you want on Linux. It's, fair, it's very easy to get Chrome, very easy to get Microsoft Edge, depending on which one you use. You can just get that thing and it works just like it does on, on Windows. Like you're not, There's no functional difference between using Chrome on Linux and Chrome on Windows or Mac. It just works really well. Basically, the only people who are screwed is if, you, if, you, if you're a Safari user, you can't use that on Linux. It just it just doesn't exist, right? And, and I think like the Arc browser, I think a lot of people are using that now. That's not here yet. But there are alternatives if you need to go to that. that the In order for that to be the situation that would apply to the most people, Chrome OS would have to be the thing, right? Because it has the experience that takes out the pain points that we've talked about for the last hour. You know, installation you know, access to applications because Chrome OS doesn't need access to applications. It's literally the web browser. Yes, they've put in some Linux apps, but that's for nerds. The vast majority of people aren't ever going to get that. They just use it for Chrome. So you have... Yeah, but if you don't care about privacy, that's a great way to go. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, and the thing is, like, for a Linux alternative to that experience to work... There has to be hardware that offers it, right? And we talked about that. And or an inst or a way to get to that point, like the best way to do it would be to have people like us install that situation for the people who would never do it on their own, right? So you know, every family member would have, you know, some someone tried to create this, like it was called Ubuntu Web, created by the kid that's eternally fourteen years old, and. and I lambasted that for being horrendous and then felt really bad because I discovered his age afterwards. But the whole idea behind that was to create an experience where everything was Firefox based. You didn't worry about the, the operating system. George Castro is in our chat right now just shouting at the screen, use Bluefin. This is the whole point of Bluefin. It is, right? <laughs> That's the whole idea behind, you know, that kind of thing is where you don't have to worry about the operating system. Everything is just, you know, you just use it, right? But I don't, I think what we're talking about here is even further than what like something like Bluefin or an atomic distro would actually offer. You really, you're not using anything. There's no software store or anything. It's just literally launches into the browser. And that's that simplicity evades even the attempts at getting towards it because uh, on Linux because we can't we can't make it that simple at least we haven't yet and the question of whether or not we should try is a complicated one because like Nate said some companies like Valve care to do it but not all of them like does Red Hat I mean it feels like Red Hat cares because they develop GNOME and System D and all the stuff that's very desktop related. Go ahead, Nate. Right, yeah, but but they do they they develop that, so they obviously have some interest in maintaining the Linux desktop, even though nobody in in you know grand scheme of things actually uses it. Like like they have to have some reason why they're doing that. But the vast majority of their effort goes towards making sure the server works really really well. Canonical, same thing. They don't care about the, the Linux desktop in the grand scheme of things. It could go away. They wouldn't lose any money. I mean, because they make all of their money on server subscription and support, right? So do are, are there companies out there that really care about the desktop experience? I would argue even Steam doesn't care about the desktop experience because it just launches into Steam. If their desktop experience went away and they just, it was literally just Steam, the vast majority of Steam Deck users that weren't Linux nerds already win nobody. In fact, I'm a Linux nerd. I've never seen the Linux desktop on my Steam Deck. Ever. Because I don't want... 
I, I don't care to go use it. I don't need to. Oh, pop. <laughs> pop OS. Nobody cares. There's the one company. There's nobody <laughs> that cares about that silly little distro, Nate. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you ask for a company that cares about their desktop, there is one <laughs> Yeah, I, that I know of. I, I mean, that's a good point. System76 would have a lot harder time being who they are without their own desktop and stuff. So very niche, though, right? You know? It it is, but at the same time, it at least they do provide some documentation, and they do provide a way to at least have some hardware that is relatable to Linux. And and they do a good job of doing kind of what Apple does, making sure that their software and hardware work mm. really really well together, right? But they also do the Apple thing, and that their hardware is really freaking expensive, right? <laughs> like they they did a good job of emulating Apple, and that like it's really pricey to go buy one. It, it, it's one of those. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's up there. And, and the, the the biggest problem is that the the examples that you can come up with, Papa West, Tuxedo, Slimbook, you know, very. I mean, it's really, System Seventy Six is the only one in the United States that's like that. Europe has quite a few of them that are like boutique Linux vendors, but the United States has one. Really, I mean, you can import or whatever, but the examples are so niche; they're really, really expensive. And it's just really hard to say this is going to be the th the company that breaks it open, right? And mm -hmm. it, well, and the problem is too, like uh, for example, you bought even now if you bought a Windows laptop, you would have to wipe Windows, then you would have to install Linux, and then you would have to try to resell it, and that's kind of the issue that they run into. And so by the time you get done with all that, you're going to be around the same price they are. Well, and when you set, I mean, I don't know that how big of an audience System76 has to non-Linux users, right? Like, the, I, I bet that the vast majority of people who buy a System76 rig were already using Linux. And in order for the problems that we've been talking about to, to be alleviated a little bit, that stuff has to appeal to... The masses right and it just it doesn't some of its price but also people i mean people aren't i don't think that their seo is so good when someone googles brand new linux computer that system 76 comes up as the, as the first result you know you're gonna get things like dell and lenovo and asus and all that stuff you get those brands uh, and google shopping google shopping is never going to recommend system 76 so maybe we can just blame google for all the problems that we have it, it was so easy but i i think that everything is just the problem, as people tell me, and every time I make a, a video that basically says Linux is better than Windows, someone gets into the comments and says something along the lines of, Linux is a hobby, and it's for tinkers only, and it's for nerds, or something like that, and that's true. Like, like it's not that you can't get work done on, on Linux, we all do it. Like we all, like I do all of my work that I actually get paid for on a Linux computer. I wouldn't touch Linux or Windows if you pay me to as my personal daily driver. But you can see that that stereotype of it being a hobby, being for nerds, is something that is damn near impossible to overcome even if you solved all the problems if you if you just made it chrome os you would still have all of the baggage that linux has managed to gather over the last 30 years and it makes it really hard to sell it you know and and, and that's the thing like in order to make linux attract like there are a lot of things that make linux attractive it's more private it's not beholden to microsoft you don't have to reboot it every three and a half seconds because it tells you you have to or you're going to die you know it's not as much of a target for malware and ransomware and viruses you know you, you can go down the line about the superiorness of linux but none of those points lead to a great marketing campaign because nobody cares the vast majority of Windows, Windows users don't care that Windows or Microsoft spies on them. They don't care. I mean, they're not. Who can? They think. Oh, all I do is look up micro, look up recipes. Who cares if Microsoft knows what recipes I look up? Ooh, you know what I mean. It, and you, you can't go on a mass marketing campaign to regular normies and say, well, you know, Linux is more private. Linux is open source because you can look at the code. 
What, what's a what's a six you know a regular person like a brand new new user look, gonna do looking at the code like <laughs> I mean that that's the thing that always bugs me like people will say you should use open source because you can look at the code that's great if you know what code means or what it does or why you'd want to do it but the vast majority of people they don't like they're not developers so yeah it's great that some people out there can look at the code and I think it's great for us but for the Unwashed masses, they don't care. That's not something they care about. And having no way of saying these things are great about Linux, this is why you should use it, makes all those pain points stand out more because you can't point to something that's awesome and say, you know, this is why you should overlook all the pain that it is to switch. So, I don't know. I, I, it feels like, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, it, it feels like an uphill battle or an uphill climb that we probably should just give up on because yes linux has slowly crept up in terms of market share but is it ever going to get to you know five percent ten percent do we want it to you know all those questions that we've asked forever and ever you know are all still there and none of them have good answers like it is so good i think drew actually had a point Yes. <laughs> yeah. You actually did have a point on something because I think that instead of trying to focus on hardware, if we can just get the software availability and that's literally it because there's a lot of people on windows. They're mad with windows because they don't like the directions it's going, but the software is just not there. Their only other options, they go to Mac OS, which then you go into the whole, you know, you got to buy, you know, a kidney and a arm and a leg machine before you can even have the Mac OS experience. But anyways, so I think Drew was right. I think it's a lot of it's going to be software based. I think that's part of it. I think that also that I think that when people just decide, I'm going to give this a shot. I think they would be really, really pleasantly surprised if they just had an, an attitude that they can do it. I mean, it, I think that a lot of times people are like, and you know, I, you know, I, I hate to, the, to be a curmudgeon or something like that when it's like, oh, I get, I get so frustrated when this happens. Just have an open mind. And then it is really on us as the Linux community to help these people out. You know, a couple, I don't know, it was a while back, but one of Matt's Linux users groups had a new user, uh, and I don't remember his name, uh, Patrick, actually, I think his, his name was. And he was a new user, had only been on a Linux distribution for a short time. And I applauded him, and I think we all did at the Linux users group, that welcome to the community, thanks for trying it. And he was having a, such, a, such a good experience in that transition from away from Windows. If we as a community had users groups specifically for maybe these beginner users, I think that they would find that it's just not that daunting. And I don't know, I'm just being kind of a Pollyanna a little bit, but I hope that I hope that we all recognize that the freedom that we have as Linux users can be translated into somebody helping somebody else out. That's a very po you know what's ahead name. I was going to say, you know what's helped me too in my business? Being able to explain to people that I can get Linux installed onto their old hardware and they don't have to upgrade. Yeah. That's been a big thing for me. I First off, Drew, way too positive. I'm sorry, your hand. <laughs> like, what, what, are you, what, are, what are you doing, man? You can't be that positive on this podcast. Get, get, get away from me. Uh, second of all, it, it, it is the that's exactly the right attitude to have. Like the If people... You can tell right away when someone switches to Linux whether or not they're going to succeed or not, you know, because the people who are open minded or are willing to look for alternatives to the software that they use, who are willing to fix the problems that, you know, if they're out there Googling how to fix a problem, they're probably going to make it probably, you know, 80 to 90 percent of those people, if, if they can find the solution are going to make it just fine, you know, because they're willing to learn, they're willing to accept help. The people who are expecting it to work right out of the box and have no problems whatsoever and have it work exactly like Windows, those are going to be the problem people. But I, I wonder, 
how prevalent that attitude actually is these days. Um, because I think that Linux, enough people who you, if you're coming into Linux, chances are you probably know it's not Windows. And if you if you've managed to grasp that one simple fact, you're already well into the into the process of being able to actually use. Linux in a proper way with a proper headset uh, mindset and know that you it's just not going to function the same as as Windows and if and you can go on forth and discover how it does work mold your workflow and your usage of the operating system to how you need it to work with the ways that are available to you and if you have that mindset that's going to be great and I think that if we you're right, Drew. You're absolutely right, Drew. That the Linux community can do what the Linux community can do. Like we 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 can't solve the lack of Adobe, the lack of AutoCAD. We can't we can't do it. We can't make GIMP better. We've we've we've, we've tried, right? We can't make GIMP move fast. We can't do any of that stuff. But what we can do as a Linux community, as is not be assholes. You know, I I think the golden rule. Don't be an asshole. And if you can. If, if we can welcome people more a little bit more, I think that would make more people stick around because they can, if they discover how awesome the Linux community is, I mean, we're all a bunch of awesome people, I think, the vast majority of us, you know, if people can discover that, I think they'll stick around, you know, unless they have some game breaking feature that just they can't get over, right? Like, uh, you know, their favorite game doesn't work or they really can't find an alternative to Photoshop that they can enjoy or, or, or uh, video editing software or whatever it is, right? If they can't get that fixed and can't get over it, then they'll go back. But it won't be because they discovered the RTFM guys in the arts forums, you know, which unfortunately they, those guys still do exist. So there you go. I think that's all we wanted to say about this. Is there anything else you guys wanted to say on this topic? No. We beat it to death. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and move on to the last thing uh, of the podcast. We went a little bit over this time. We're over an hour. But anyways, the last part of the podcast is the Nuggies of the Week. And let me... I I tooted this out earlier. I had uh, chicken nuggets for lunch today. And the biggest sin that Microsoft... Or that Microsoft... uh, That uh, that McDonald's can do is give you the Nuggies without the sauce. Like, seriously, it's horrendous. Turns out, chicken nuggets, not that great without something to dip them in. Who knew? But anyways, the the nuggies of the week are our place where we can share our favorite tools, tips, tricks, all that stuff. And we share them with you guys because we think that they're awesome. So Drew, what is your nuggie of the week? I can't remember when, but I remember Gnome mentioning something about TLDR. And it was, I think it's a Linux user group, uh, maybe a week or two ago. It doesn't matter. Anyway, my my nuggie of the week is TLDR. It is a community-driven, simplified version of man pages. Um, So if you are in the terminal and you say TLDR LS, it gives you a concise, uh, practical example of those common commands. It simplifies lengthy and complex uh, descriptions in the traditional man pages and makes it short and easy to understand and is, I didn't realize it was even a thing until like a couple weeks ago. And it's like really, really stinking cool. I, I, if you haven't seen or used TLDR, I recommend you giving it a shot. It is very good. Nate, your nuggie of the week. So mine is another hardware thing. And this is kind of common knowledge in Linux, but uh, especially for a new user, if you're looking for a good laptop to use, Please look no further than Lenovo ThinkPads because they are just awesome. In particular, I just picked up, well, I showed it a while ago, but I just picked up this bad boy. This is a Lenovo T470, and it just works. I, I've had I had a X, uh, X11 X si- system on there. Now I'm on Wayland because I have Cosmic on it. It's I don't have any issues with it. it everything seems to work fine. And so if you're looking for something that's actually just going to work with Linux, I really recommend getting a Lenovo ThinkPad just because they are that good. I, I Definitely for older hardware, if you want to, if you need something really cheap, definitely go get one of those. All right. So mine is a, 
Docker application, actually. Uh, this is actually created, I believe it was a fork by him, but he, he put it in a Docker container. It's by TechnoTim, so he's the one of the home lab guys on YouTube. He created something called Link, link Tree Dash Server, and basically what this will allow you to do is, if you, you're at all familiar with Linktree, basically it's a website that has your links on it, like things like to your YouTube channel or your email or your website or whatever, and you host this thing, it allows you to create a website that just has all your links to it. So you don't have to rely on a third party service that has all your links. You can just create it, point it towards a, a GitLab page or a, you know, um, through an Nginx or a, a Cloudflare tunnel or whatever you want to do. And you can basically, for this one, all you do is put all of your links in the, the Docker container. There's little spots for everything from uh, GitHub and Twitch to all that kind of stuff. You just put it in there and it just creates a very pretty page for all of your links that you can point to as like a portfolio or when you say, hey, contact me at this place, you can just hand them your link tree URL and it will send you, it'll send that user to all of your links where they can get a hold of you. And it's awesome. It's all self-hosted, free and open source. It's great. So uh, Linktree server is mine. So that is it for the Linux cast. Now, a few things of housekeeping before we jump out. First, no podcast next week. It is Thanksgiving here in the States, so happy Thanksgiving to everybody, but there will be not be a Linux cast next Thursday, which is Thanksgiving. So there you go. So you'll have to miss us for a week. We'll be back in the first week of December for a couple more episodes before we head on out for the rest of the year. And the second thing is, I've forgotten the second thing. So we'll just move on to the contact information. I'm sure it wasn't important. That's why you, should, you write things down. Anyways, uh, you can contact with, you can find us and contact us via email. That's probably the best way. That's email at the linuxcast.org. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast. Uh, Drew has a YouTube channel. He's just a guy Linux. He is a guy who does videos on Debian, on Nextcloud, on Home Lab stuff, on scripting, on window managers. You should go check it out. Uh, Nate also has a YouTube channel. He's at, good lord, I really need to desperately write this down. Nate Picks Tech World on YouTube. Uh, yep, you got it. Link in the description below if you don't want to have to type that out. Uh, he does videos and will do videos in the future so check that out give him a subscribe if he can get his audio situation maybe if he wasn't using pop os and would use a real oh, linux distro wow. his audio wouldn't suck at least my gpu works oh, shut up <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least i can use davinci resolve you s I don't like you anymore. It's okay. Anyway, anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, you can find all of our contact information at thelinuxcast.org slash contact. Thelinuxcast.org is the website. There you'll find all the previous episodes all the way back to season one, uh, except for the first three episodes. The first three episodes will never be seen again. I do have them. I listen to them every once in a while just to remind myself how bad it can get. Uh, anyways, those things do exist. Uh, you can check all that stuff out at thelinkscast.org. Again, we record this live usually every Tuesday. But again, there won't be any live broadcast next week, but usually every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to watch us live, if you can't catch us live, we post the edited version, which is basically the entire podcast minus the pre-show and all of my ums. That's basically what it is. Um, usually better audio, so it's a little bit better. So you can check that out. That comes out on Saturday evenings usually, except for this last week where it was a day late because, again, Matt's audio. <laughs> Matt, uh, this time it was Matt's audio that was crap and had nothing to do with Papa West. It's all Audacity's fault. Anyways, that is it for this one. We'll see you guys next time. If you're in the States, happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you.